Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's Waldenstrom's Macroglobal Anemia Live webinar. My name is Nicole Douglas. I'm one of the Blood Cancer Support Coordinators from the Leukaemia Foundation, and it's my pleasure to be hosting today's event, which is a joint initiative of the Leukaemia Foundation and WM Aussies. I understand that we also have people joining us from New Zealand, so we'd like to extend a warm welcome to you also, and hope that you find the following sessions really beneficial. We're incredibly fortunate to have a number of guest speakers today who amongst their busy schedules have generously agreed to donate their time and expertise. Now throughout the webinar, which we anticipate running for between one to one and a half hours, we invite you to forward any questions you may have by typing into the Q&A chat function, which you can locate in the panel on the top right hand corner of your screen. My colleagues Nez Georgievic will be collating your questions at the end of each presentation. Now we apologise in advance if we don't manage to cover everyone's question today, but please feel free to reach out to one of our blood cancer support coordinators after the event and we'll endeavour to assist you further. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to our first speaker for this afternoon, Professor, Professor Judith Trotman. Professor Trotman is a haematologist and head of department at the Concord Repatriation General Hospital, University of Sydney. She is committed to embedding lymphoma research into clinical care as the founding director of the Concord Haematology Clinical Research Unit. Dr. Trotman is a leading recruiter in the Innovate study of rituximab plus or minus ibrutinib in WM and led the WM cohort analysis of a large phase 1-2 study of xanabrutinib. She is the principal investigator on numerous lymphoma studies and co-principal investigator on the Wardenstrom's macroglobulinemia study involving Cartwheel, otherwise known as Whimsical, an innovative research partnership with patient investigators from WM Aussies and the IWMF. Committed to collaboration in trials recruitment across the spectrum of haematologic malignancies, she is co-inventor of Clin Trial Refer, the cross-referral smartphone app, increasing patient recruitment across numerous cancer trials nationally. Thank you so much for your time today, Professor Trotman. We'll now cross to you. Thank you very much, Nicole, and um, hello everyone. Kia ora to my Kiwi colleagues. Uh, I'm delighted, Nicole. It wasn't a deliberate setup that you couldn't pronounce Wardenstrom's macroglobulinemia because neither can I, uh, neither can most people, and that's why I'm sure that's part of the secret source for why WM Aussies and uh, IWMF are so successful uh, and so digitally uh, connected with each other. So what I have done is I have taken the older clinician's prerogative of doing the easy talk and um, doing the intro talk and left the, the complicated, exciting, novel new therapies uh, to Professor Tam, who's going to be speaking next. Uh, so don't forget to button uh, presenter and uh, con. If I forget to stop at the slides we agreed I was going to stop at. Uh, let's go. So, Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia, what a big name. Um, move on to the next slide, thanks. Um, and we're going to go through in these slides what is this unpronounceable uh, condition, which forces you all to write it down on a piece of paper. It forces your haematologist to write it down on a piece of paper so that you can uh, Google it and go to WM Aussies, go to the Leukemia Foundation, I'm sure I've got some great material, but also go to the International Wadenstrom's Macroglobulinemia Foundation to learn about your disease. But this is for those who haven't yet gone there. For those, this is about WM 101, okay? This is about the basics. So I suspect a number of you online uh, know everything I'm about to tell you but it's really important for those of you who've just learned how to spell WM uh, to, to understand a few basics before you plunge into the nitty gritty of all the complicated uh, minutiae that you can get online from these organisations. I'm going to go through how Waldenstrom's presents, uh, what tests we need to diagnose and to monitor it uh, and to monitor the response to therapy. We're going to discuss who needs treatment and, and when. And then, as I said, my um, dear colleague, uh, Professor Contam, is going to go through all the uh, treatment recommendations and uh, talk a little bit about clinical trials now and in the future. Thank you, Justin. Next slide, thanks. So it's 
called a low-grade non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So non-Hodgkin's lymphoma are lymphomas of uh, pancers, effectively, of B and T lymphocytes. And uh, this is a B lymphocyte uh, lymphoma, and it's called low-grade because it's generally a very slow-growing, what we call indolent uh, development of uh, disease. Now, uh, it's called, uh, its proper title, which no one actually ever uses, is lymphoplasmocytic lymphoma. And that's because there's this infiltration. Now, obviously, Justin, they can't see me using the cursor, can they? Um, a lymph uh, infiltration in the bone marrow of, uh, of these cells, which look like uh, either lymphocytes or look like plasma cells. And you can see the uh, sort of classic looking lymphocyte is more that one with the yellow arrow in the picture there. Uh, whereas the classic looking plasma cells, oh, well done, Justin, you <laughs> very good morphology. Um, and then the uh, the black arrows there, or, or the arrowhead, uh, they're more what we call classic looking plasma cells, where you've got that more intense blue purple cytoplasm and an eccentrically placed, um, pushed out to the side circular nucleus. Um, and along with these cells that infiltrate into the bone marrow and sometimes into the lymph nodes in about 30% of people, these cells are antibody producing. They produce an antibody. Um, the more formal name for antibody is called immunoglobulin. And they produce a very specific immunoglobulin called immunoglobulin M. Now you've got a picture there of immunoglobulin M, IgM, down underneath uh, the IgG and the other antibodies. And the thing you'll notice there is that it is what we call a pentama. It's got five antibody arms to it. And that makes it a very big protein. And it's that size of the protein that as the protein levels get higher and higher, that's what creates the hyperviscosity and, and the easy, uh, ready, ready tiredness that people get with, with Waldenstrom's. And we'll discuss that a little bit uh, more later. It's defined as a rare cancer because its incidence, the new diagnoses each year, is only three per million. Uh, so that's why it's really important in this digital world that patients with WM are so well uh, connected uh, digitally. And it's generally a cancer of older people in that the median age is 71 at diagnosis. Uh, and very few haematologists will see people in their um, you know, 40s with WM, but it does, it does happen. Uh, and it is more commonly a, a cancer of Caucasians and uh, has a two to one male to female ratio. Thanks. Now, do you interrupt me. I can't actually see any of the chat. So if there's any messages coming through, you might have to interrupt me because all I can see at the moment is my um, slides. Uh, so here's a picture. Um, here's a few screenshots of a bone marrow trephine biopsy. When we do a bone marrow biopsy for Waldenstrom's, we're actually doing two tests. The first, when they put the needle in, is that short, sort of sharp one second of pain you get when we aspirate out with a syringe a mill or two of bone marrow. And we put a drop of that bone marrow with all its fragments onto some um, uh, some slides, glass slides, and spread it, and the haematologist will look down the microscope at those cells and identify what percentage of all the bone marrow cells are the uh, lymphocytes and the plasma cells. And if there are more than 10%, it meets the diagnostic criteria for Waldenstrom's. But as I think you can appreciate on the image on the top left there, where that intense sort of triangle of blue infiltrative cells there, 
Waldenstrom's can be patchy like other diseases like uh, myeloma, which is sort of the sister disease to Waldenstrom's. So that's where getting a trefine, a little core of bone with its surrounding bone marrow. So you can see the sort of the pink trabecula of the bone there in the, in the hip, along with the cells of the bone and the fatty circles of all of the fat globules. Uh, getting it refined shows us much more, uh, much broader area and can help detect where the disease is patchy, which can sometimes be missed on the smaller sample of a bone marrow aspirate. So a bone marrow aspirate I often sell to patients is a bit like going inside the house and opening the fridge and seeing all the details of inside the fridge. Whereas the trefine is standing at the garden gate, getting an overall picture of the architecture of, of, this, of the place, but you can't see the fine cellular detail. And in addition to looking at the cells on the aspirate and the trefine, we also can use stains on the trefine for the various proteins that are expressed on the surface of the Waldenstrom cell, the surface of these lymphoplasmacytic cells. Um, and the two useful proteins for diagnosis is the CD20 stain, and that's the brown stain you can see on the top right, along with staining for the IgM protein that is produced uh, by these cells. Next slide, thanks. So we talked about how it was a rare cancer, but I like the slide because you're not alone. And there is a picture, I think, at the new International Conference Centre in Sydney uh, a few years ago where we had um, the Leukaemia Foundation, WM Aussies, the Australian support group, uh, with its ex-leader, uh, the very handsome man on the left there, uh, Andrew Warden, on the far left. And uh, this was a gathering where we had uh, I think it was Steve Trion had come over from uh, the world leading Bing Neal Cancer Center in uh, Boston and he gave a fantastic uh, lecture and we had a great uh, gathering of all these WM enthusiasts, uh, clinicians, patients and carers. So how does it present? Well, the first thing is a few of you are sitting here knowing that you actually have no symptoms of your Waldenstrom's. And it was detected in a routine blood test where your GP picked up that the total protein in your blood was elevated. And when we look at what we call patients' electrolytes and liver tests uh, that we often do as sort of a, often GPs will do as a routine thing along with a routine full blood count perhaps once a year, and they notice that your total protein is elevated beyond the normal range. Now, total protein is a combination of the normal healthy nutrition protein called albumin and all the immunoglobulins. And it is just doesn't happen, it never occurs that your albumin is elevated. So if the total protein is elevated, the GP will then go on and ask to get your immunoglobulins, in particular your IgG, your IgA and your IgM measured and identify which of those immunoglobulins is elevated. And that's how a diagnosis of WM is made because those lymphoplasmacytic cells are producing too much of this IgM protein, these IgM immunoglobulins. And the, that's, uh, that IgM measurement is what helps us cinch the diagnosis. And yet, just because you've got Waldenstrom's diagnosed because of the elevated protein, if you don't have any of the symptoms listed there, you are said to be asymptomatic and that requ doesn't require any treatment uh, most of the time. Patients, however, often present with fatigue and I'll give you the data that you've given us in the uh, whimsical uh, to let you know just how many. The symptoms of hyperviscosity are fatigue. So, you know, people can be fatigued because of their anemia or their hyperviscosity because of the elevated IgM levels, particularly once IgM levels get higher than about 40 grams per litre. Um, but if you have anemia and an elevated IgM, then obviously you're going to get fatigued a lot earlier than if you just have one or the other. And because of that viscosity, um, the blood doesn't flow as well as it normally does. 
uh, and it sort of starts becoming a bit like treacle in the um, very sort of very viscous uh, flow in the blood vessels, particularly the smaller uh, blood vessels, which is the reason why people get nosebleeds, headaches and often some blurred vision. Um, and that presentation is actually quite uncommon when people start coming with blurred vision and uh, drowsiness and that's usually when the IgM is very high usually over 60 or 70 grams per litre and needs urgent treatment um, and that rarely happens because usually people present to the GP with their fatigue um, long before that happens. Sometimes people present with enlarged lymph nodes, but usually that's diagnosed uh, incidentally. Uh, and a few patients will present with uh, high fevers over 38 degrees, uh, weight loss more than 10% of their body mass and uh, night sweats. And these are drenching night sweats that mean you have to change the pajamas and bed sheets, uh, not just feeling a hot uh, hot around the neck. Uh, we talked about nosebleeds and then sometimes people can have a peripheral neuropathy um, and it's a sensory neuropathy which results in numbness in what we call the glove and stocking distribution so in the fingers and toes and moves gradually up from the peripheries um, and this is generally not a painful neuropathy it's just a numbness. So these are the rarer presentations of Waldenstroms and if anyone wants to ask a question about them, I'm more than happy to discuss it at the end, but I think there's probably no point labouring these at the moment in the interest of time. So we'll move on. Uh, so this is a photo of the ex uh, president or chair of WM, the leader, I think he called himself, uh, Andrew Warden, in having uh, intravenous immunoglobulin in the days when we used to give intravenous immunoglobulin before COVID came along and we taught him how to do it uh, and administer it to himself at home once a week under uh, in a subcutaneous manner. And Andrew, of course, has consented to have this photo being used. And he has really led patient empowerment, um, not just in Australia, but globally. And he is the instigator of Whimsical. All right, basically, I didn't really have much choice. Uh, it was sort of under Andrew's direction that we established Whimsical, uh, and it's been led by Andrew and my very talented fellow, Ibrahim Tahidi Esfahani. Uh, and this is Australian led, but it is a global initiative um, driven by patients. And we're using this rare cancer uh, database, uh, the cartwheel database that comes out of uh, Melbourne to uh, utilise it and tweak it to uh, be specific for Waldenstrom's uh, issues. And globally, we've now had 453 patients register consent online and enter uh, an ongoing record of their health and cancer related data. And I thought, why not let you guys be some of the first people to see some of the results of uh, Whimsical, if we can go to the next slide, thanks, because you are effectively the investigators. And oh, so here's a photo of Ibrahim with myself um, on the left there. So if we can go back um, and the aim is to develop this continuously expanding database to provide a platform for we, we can ask the questions and address the hypotheses based around WM um, that you want answered um, and report, you know, patient reported outcomes that complement the clinical trial data that we get. And we really think this real world global uh, treatment data is, is very important. And we've already started discovering things that we never expected to, to discover. Next slide, thanks. So as I said, there's 430, 53 patients. Amazingly, we're coming up with the same, well not amazingly really, we're coming up with the same median age of 70 years, 61% um, uh, men, and the fatigue occurs in half the patients, B symptoms in one out of five, peripheral neuropathy, this numbness is uh, reasonably frequent, and the symptom of leg cramps is something that we hadn't anticipated um, and what a disabling symptom that must be and for 10% of people to have these cramps um, is, is quite, um, quite uh, telling. 
Uh, and that asymptomatic is not supposed to be a, a full stop there. It's supposed to be 30%. Sorry about that. But what really shocked us is in the 302 patients who listed that they had been treated and were able to tell us what their first line therapy was, there were 46 different uh, options chosen. And if we can go next, Justin, um, this is um, what we call a sunburst chart, which has taken hours and hours and hours for Ibrahim to put together. But you can notice in the inner circle is the first line treatment that the patients ever received. And so you can see that big block there of bendamustine rituximab, which has definitely become flavor of the month and very de rigueur uh, for treating Waldenstrom's and certainly something that we're now available, able to use in Australia. And I like it for some Waldenstrom's patients, but not all Waldenstrom's patients. And I can explain why later. Um, the rituximab uh, in orange there, the next most commonly used first line treatment uh, is not available in Australia. And I think I'd be interested to see what Con thinks, but I think generally it's a bit of a waste to use rituximab on its own without accompanying it with a bit of chemotherapy. And that's the DRC, one of the more common regimens that we've used in Australia, dexamethasone uh, with rituximab and oral uh, chemotherapy, low dose chemotherapy, cyclophosphamide. And then there were a whole lot of other treatments. If you could just go back, Justin, sorry, there was one other thing down there. Um, this is one of the first surprises we got is we identified that um, in figure B there, that the time to first treatment after diagnosis was 48 days in the US. That was what we call the median time to first treatment. Obviously, there was a big range there, but you can see the horizontal bar down at 48. And then the median time in the rest of the world, and bearing in mind that 26% of the patients are Australia and about Australian, about 50% are from the US, Australia represents a big proportion of the rest of the world. And the median time of uh, first treatment is 100 days from diagnosis. And this is despite the fact that even though they start treatment earlier, in the US, their, their hemoglobin is um, tends to be a little bit higher when you first start treatment. And these are what we call statistically significant results. Next slide, thanks. You're doing a fantastic job. Um, so of these 453 patients, we sort of quest them using a standardized uh, stress score and 10% of them have in the boxes on the right there in red, 10% of them had a level of stress that if, uh, was consistent, 90% uh, specific for a diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder. But the good news you can see there in figure B is that patient's uh, initial stress score, the median there, that horizontal bar just above the five uh, on the left has come down a little bit and it's significantly improved uh, uh, with their last score. So it seems to say that there's a fair bit of adaptation that occurs after the diagnosis of Waldenstrom's. And we're also getting some other quality of life uh, data in figure C that basically on this uh, 30 question uh, score that patients who are on BTK inhibitors, ibrutinib, xanabrutinib, acalabrutinib have a better quality of life than the patients who are not on BTK inhibitors and have been had treatment within the past year. So this is the power of whimsical. We're starting to get some real world data about patient experiences globally. Next slide. So let's go back to the diagnostic workup. Um, obviously, we're going to ask, take a history and ask you about your symptoms and your family history because Waldenstrom's is the one lymphoma where there is a, a, a familial association and about 7% seven, 7 or 8% of patients will have a family member who also has a raised IgM um, or has uh, had you know, some sort of potentially some undiagnosed lymphoma um, in, in decades ahead but it certainly is the one lymphoma where there is uh, some familial association for a minority of patients. Um, and the key, we'll obviously examine you to see if we've got any palpable lymph nodes, uh, whether your spleen is enlarged, which can be uh, definitely the case uh, with Waldenstrom's, and whether you have any you know, cutaneous features, you know, 
uh, particularly uh, problems with, say, ulcers because of the cryoglobulin. Uh, we do a full blood count um, primarily because we want to know your haemoglobin. It's not so often um, without treatment, without chemotherapy, that patients have low white cells or platelets. We obviously want to know how your liver and your kidney function is performing, but in particular, we want to know what that IgM level is and what that clonal, what we call paraprotein. But for Waldenstrom's, it's the IgM that's the important thing, uh, not so much the paraprotein. Um, and we won't go into the nitty gritty of uh, cryoglobulins uh, here and now because uh, I'm mindful of time. Uh, we also look at uh, a few other tests and the test that I'm particularly keen on looking at is your iron studies because I think iron deficiency is grossly under recognized in Waldenstrom's where patients don't absorb iron very well uh, because they, the Waldenstrom's produces a protein called hepcidin which inhibits the absor oral absorption of iron. So a lot of patients with Waldenstrom's need intravenous iron support. Uh, next line. Um, now, if that's too much detail for you, it's important you know three factors, your IgM level, your haemoglobin, so you need to know if you're anemic or not, and your ferritin, the iron in the tin, the iron stores. Next one. Um, as I said, I showed you the image of the bone marrow biopsy and we do that when you have symptoms of WM or if your IgM level is greater than 10 and it's rising and we think you might be heading towards a need for treatment in the future and we, we want to know uh, whether or not you have Waldenstrom's or not. Um, and the importance of that is to assess not just the degree of involvement of Waldenstrom's but also how well your normal uh, early blood cell uh, progenitors, um, blood producing cells in the bone marrow are because as people get older sometimes um, their blood cell production can be a bit abnormal and it's important to recognize that before we start racing into things like chemotherapy. And we can do some special uh, cancer gene tests that I'll talk talk about a little bit later. And we generally do a CT scan uh, from your neck to your pelvis to see uh, which lymph nodes are enlarged and whether your, or your spleen is enlarged. But what is important that unlike all other lymphomas, where I am in particular uh, an enthusiast for PET scanning, there really is no role um, with rare exceptions, um, if we're concerned the Waldenstrom's is uh, changing its stripes and is no longer an indolent lymphoma but could be in the rare situation transforming into an aggressive lymphoma, we might do a PET scan. But generally speaking, there is no role for PET scanning uh, for monitoring and uh, following up patients with Waldenstrom's. So the important genomics for uh, Waldenstrom's that have come out is we know that 95% of people have this uh, point mutation in this mid-88 gene, uh, which was, uh, is, uh, is a gene that uh, helps uh, drive B cell uh, proliferate, growth and pr proliferation um, and migration of the B cells. And uh, it's, it's very useful to know. Um, it's sort of sort of useful. It's it's very because so many patients are positive. Um, it's and because it's so unusual that someone with clear cut uh, Waldenstrom's is mid eighty eight negative. It's somewhat moot whether or not we have to do the mid eighty uh, eight testing, but certainly it's it's worthwhile uh, doing if we're not quite sure whether someone has Waldenstrom's or another uh, lymphoma, commonly a, a nodal marginal zone lymphoma. The test that is becoming increasingly more prominent and useful is the CXCR4 mutation testing. And this is a bit tricky. I've got not done in US, but Con can correct me because I think they are testing that now down in Peter McCallum Cancer Center. But the problem with that is it's not just one mutation, it's, it's dozens of different mutations, what we call frame sense and nonsense uh, mutations in the um, WM cells. And uh, they, 
the is emerging evidence that suggests that patients with particularly with nonsense mutations um, uh, their disease is not as uh, responsive or uh, the duration of response to abrutinib is not so good so we'll probably start to see that uh, creeping in uh, more and more but it's actually quite a difficult test to do it's not something you can get in your local laboratory easily thanks so the reason we don't rush to treat you is because many patients can live a long life and particularly before the advent of um, the BTK inhibitors and novel therapies for treating Waldenstrom's, um, we, uh, you know, we knew that we only had chemotherapy up our sleeves and we didn't want to go racing in and give people chemotherapy and put them through the side effects of chemotherapy and the toxicity of chemotherapy unless they really were going to benefit from it. Um, and so that's why um, we tend not to rush to treat patients unless they start getting symptomatic or their IgM starts getting very high, say over 50 grams per litre. Next slide, thanks. And I think my last slide or two is basically uh, talking about the treatments that uh, we have uh, for frontline treatment in Australia. And I've listed there that we start it when you get anemic is the most common cause or if that IgM is sort of over 50 or 60 grams per litre. Next slide. So Bendamustine and rituximab in combination are now funded uh, for the last couple of years in first line treatment of Waldenstrom's. And no one has ever done a head to head comparison between bendamustine and rituximab with dexamethasone, cyclophosphamide and rituximab, which is uh, a, a gentler chemotherapy uh, option. And while a lot of patients, I think bendamustine and rituximab is, is very good because there's a suggestion in um, you know, what we call phase two studies uh, where the progression free survival, so the duration of surviving without the Waldenstrom's growing again or without dying is probably upwards of five years whereas it's probably only about three plus years um, when you have dexamethasone, cyclophosphamide and rituximab. But every patient with Waldenstrom's is different. And for a patient who's been watched and waited for 10 years with WM, they've got a very, very indolent disease. And for the older patient who's been uh, watched and waited, and even some of the not so old patients um, who've been had only a very, very slow progression to needing therapy. Um, I think dexamethasone, cyclophosphamide and rituximab has uh, great uh, benefit, great merit, uh, and we can save, uh, potentially save the bendamustine, which isn't too expensive uh, for later down the track. Um, particularly in the, mo at the current time in COVID, um, look, you know, we might be coming out of it, but we, we don't know yet. Um, there's still a fair way to go um, where bendamustine is really quite immune suppressive and suppresses people's uh, immune system for up to two years uh, and sometimes longer. Uh, it's it, to me is a bit of a concern because I don't think patients uh, are going to necessarily mount such a fabulous response to the COVID vaccination or mount a good tolerance of COVID if they were to get it. So it's, you know, sort of depends on where you are in the COVID headspace um, as to how comfortable you are with uh, the more immune suppressive agents such as bendamustine. Um, we, we don't tend to give rituximab maintenance uh, for Waldenstrom's uh, and certainly not after uh, bendamustine because it just increases the infection rate uh, too much. And, you know, while we've got different studies um, and we're sort of comparing different populations with different inclusion criteria. Um, at the Mayo Clinic in the US, when they looked back over 160 patients, they couldn't identify a significant progression for your overall survival advantage to bendamustine rituximab. So I, you know, I don't feel incredibly strongly um, pro one or the other. Uh, as first line chemotherapy options in Australia. And I think it's an individual um, situation. So I think I'll leave that there.
think that's when I'm done. Thank you so much, Professor Trotman, um, and thanks for, for giving my pronunciation as well. Um, it's wonderful to have someone with your level of expertise and knowledge who also has such a wonderful way of explaining things in such a clear and concise way. Um, I loved your analogies about around the bone marrow biopsies as well. Um, we've actually had some questions coming through both in our live chat and we've also had some people who have pre-submitted some questions. So if you still have a little further time, uh, Judith, we might I might swap over to sure. SNES to run through some of those questions. Okay. And then we'll then we'll get to Professor Tam, who I know is also very keen. <laughs> okay, <laughs> but also we'll leave we'll leave Con unmuted um, so that he can add further comment to the questions as well. Yeah. Perfect, that'd be great. Excellent, thank you, Nicole. So yes, we did in, received some interesting questions, both pre-submitted and via Q and A window. So first question for Professor Trotman: I was diagnosed in November. Uh, still on watch and wait regimen and every three months I have appointment with my specialist. Last time my IgM level went up from 15 to 18. Sorry, just uh, 18, uh, but still not much symptoms uh, apart from little fatigue. I'm 62 this year. Is there anything I can do to prevent going up? or protein going no. up or does no, it that's a good question. does it on thing and no matter about diets taking vitamins etc yeah. yeah look i think that's a really good description it does its own thing that's mm. uh, that encapsulates it beautifully it's sort of it's sort of cast in the biology and the genetic profile of the waldenstroms that it will progress at its own rate um and that's whereby the week, you know, the follow up every three months, uh, if it is increasing, is appropriate because you will get, you know, the more points you get on the graph, the more you get a sense of what the tempo of the disease is and whether it's going to be a gradual incline or suddenly take it, taking off or not. So your your hematologist generally will say, oh, I'll see you in three months or I'll see you in four months or I'll see you in six months or one month, depending on, you know, how 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 rapid that rise in the IgM um, is. Pa this is the universal question that patients with lymphoma give. What can I do to um, slow the progression of the disease? And there is absolutely nothing you can do except for treatments that you receive for the WM that will slow its, you know, its predetermined um, progress rate of progression. But what you can do and what is really important is if it looks like it is progressing, well, that's the time to start getting yourself in shape and making sure your cholesterol is good, your blood pressure is good, um, you're eating, eating well, you're not drinking too much, you're not, you know, burning the midnight oil and working 80 hour weeks and doing, um, you know, five hours sleep each night, you know, you start looking after your general health so that you're in great shape for when it's time to, to start treatment. Okay. As for vitamins, I don't, I think vitamins are great. You can take them if you like, if it makes you feel you're doing something to help your, your body, but a good healthy diet is all you need. The one vitamin that for my other lymphoma patients, you know, they may want to take if they were iron deficient as iron supplements, but it's a bit of a waste of time in Waldenstrom's because as I said before, people don't tend to absorb oral iron very well. So I think if it looks like you're anemic, it's really important to ask your hematologist, can you make sure I'm not iron deficient and that's not a factor contributing to my anemia because then often intravenous iron is needed. Very good. Thank you, Dr. Trotman. Uh, second question. Are there any plans to lobby the government for ibrutinib to be added on the PBS for the treatment of Waldenstrom? Uh, uh, can can patients assist yeah. in this process? Yeah, look, I think that's a bigger question that we should discuss after Professor Tam's talk, but trust me, there's been a lot of advocacy. I like to put it in a positive term rather than lobbying. <laughs> been a lot of advocacy uh, on part of Leukemia Foundation and WM Aussies and um, Con and myself and all lymphoma clinicians to, to try and access these therapies for patients. Right, thank you. Are people who have strokes routinely tested for Waldenstrom? Could Waldenstrom be, Waldenstrom be under underdiagnosed? Look, that's a good question, but the, no, they're not because um, 
Waldenstrom's doesn't really cause strokes in the classic sense of the word. Waldenstrom's, because of the hyperviscosity, can cause very temporary, very short blurring of vision, um, you know, headaches. It's very, I've, I've never seen a patient present with Waldenstrom's with a classical stroke where they have, you know, a bleed in the brain or an occlusion of one of the big arteries in the um, in the brain that causes, you know, impaired functioning of the leg or the arm or speech. So, no, I don't believe it's something that is warranted in doing for patients who have a stroke. Um, certainly, if someone who had a stroke had an elevated total protein, the stroke physician would be going and checking their immunoglobulin levels. Yes, thank you. Excellent. And if uh, we could ask one more question. Thank you, Dr. Trotman. Um, what are the chances that disease comes back more aggressively when you relapse? That's, that's a tricky question. Um, generally speaking, relapses of Waldenstrom's remain quite indolent and tr the traditional paradigm however was that the duration of response to chemotherapy was shorter with every 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 relapse so someone might have a 10-year remission the first time um, and then an eight-year remission the next time and then a five-year and then a two-year the thing that's turned that on its head has been the introduction of a brutinib and the other brutin tyrosine kinase inhibitors, which are effectively switches that switch off the activity of the WM. They don't ever get someone into a complete uh, response, um, but they can often get people into what's called a partial um, or very good partial response. And Con's going to um, go and explain all that. But actual transformation to a very aggressive lymphoma occurs very uncommonly with Waldenstrom's. Um, and so it, you know, it can sort of start becoming more resistant to treatments with time, um, but it generally remains quite an indolent disease. All right, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Trotman for answering those questions and thank you for your time. My pleasure. Yeah, nice. Oh, um, the good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Yes, well, our, our next guest speaker for this afternoon, as you've uh, no doubt guessed, is Professor Constantine Tam. Uh, Professor Tam is the clinical lead for CLL and low grade lymphoma at the Peter McCallum Cancer Centre and Professor of Professor of Hematology at the University of Melbourne. He has a keen interest in the biology and treatment of blood cancers. Professor Tam has extensive experience in the conduct of clinical trials, particularly those involving new targeted therapies. He's the global lead for the novel BTK inhibitor Zanabrutinib, and he completed the first study in the world to combine ibrutinib and venetoclax. Professor Tam participates actively in peer review and is associate editor of Blood, Blood Advances. Since 2012, Professor Tam has received over 18 million in grants. He has authored 179 papers with over 5,000 Web of Science citations. Professor Tam is a member of the American Society of Hematology, the American Society of Clinical Oncology, the American Association for Cancer Research, and the European Hematology Association. Thank you very much for joining us, Professor Tam. Thanks so much. Thanks, Delica. Um, thank you for that. Um, so, uh, leading on from uh, Dr. Professor Trotman's uh, discussion, can uh, uh, is my arrow visible uh, to everyone? No? That's fine. I don't need the arrow. Okay. Um, so uh, the, okay, the the slide here talks about the way that we classify treatment responses in Odenstrom's. Uh, and this is really relevant when we do clinical trials because as a patient, what you, what you want to see is obviously a response in your in your cancer. But what's really more important to you is how long the responses last for and how long you can get back with your friends and family before you need to um, before you need to have any more therapy for your for your Waldenstrom's disease again. But just to educate uh, the, the, the audience, essentially we judge 
how well someone responds by the how much the RGM reduces. So if the RGM reduces by 25 percent, then that is uh, then that is uh, a a sign that the treatment is responding. If they get to a uh, 50 percent uh, or more reduction, then that's what we call a partial remission and also defined as a major response because that's really a very good outcome. And in some cases where the RGM goes to uh, reduces by 90 percent or even when it's completely gone, uh, that is when we define the very best categories of response, which is very good partial remission or complete remission. Uh, for complete remission, we also need to do a bone marrow biopsy to prove that there is no uh, more disease left in the bone marrow in addition to the IgM going back to normal. So uh, this is really um, a, a cartoon to talk about um, the trend of treatment, not just in Waldenstrom's, but across all blood cancers in general. So on the left, we've got traditional chemotherapy, um, which is essentially uh, I, chemotherapy are drugs that damage the genetics in all your cells, in all your body, including the cancer and other normal cells in your body. The difference is that the uh, normal cells heal faster than cancer, so therefore we are preferentially damaging the cancer uh, more than we damage your body. But the damage sustained to your body by traditional chemotherapy is the basis for side effects uh, and why people get side effects on chemotherapy. So you click the next slide, please. So uh, what we've done recently is we've started to develop treatments which target just the lymphoma uh, with uh, less effect on normal cells in the body. And the most simple one of those are what we call antibody therapy. And many of you will have had a treatment called rituximab, which is a antibody directed against a molecule on cancer called CD20. So what antibodies are, antibodies are what your, your body manufactures when you get an infection. So if you've got influenza or pneumonia, your, your body manufactures an antibody, which then stops it from being infected by the, same, by the same bacteria again. And what we've done is that we've hijacked the antibody and instead of making it attack infection, we've made it attack cancer. So rituximab is a antibody where we have told the antibody to attack something called CD20 and CD20 is expressed on Waldenstrom cells. Uh, and this is a certain treatment that has a weak effect on Waldenstrom's. It's very popular in America, but we, let, let's see, we, we don't really use it much in Australia as a single therapy as the effects are fairly weak. But what rituximab does really well though, is it makes chemotherapy work a lot better. So uh, the way I explain to my patient is that rituximab is like adding salt to food. It makes the food taste better and makes the chemotherapy work better. Next slide, please. We also have other antibody therapies. Um, Obinutuzumab is a more potent form of rituximab and darotumumab is another antibody used in a disease called multiple myeloma, which is related to Waldenstrom's, where, um, where uh, and it attacks a different target called CD38. Next slide, please. What we'll spend a lot of the time talking today would be the, the, the things that inhibit uh, things for enzyme, which are parts, which are, 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 are proteins expressed by your lymphoma to keep it alive. Uh, and these uh, drugs turn off the specific uh, proteins in the cancer cell, and the cancer cells are quite dependent on this protein. So there is a very effective in inhibiting the cancer cell, but the normal cells in your body are much less dependent on these proteins. So therefore you are gonna experience less side effects when you take these drugs compared to chemotherapy, which damages everything in the body. And the first class of drugs that I will spend probably most of my time talking about are what we call BTK inhibitors. Uh, and these are the three drugs in that class, ibrutinib, acalabrutinib, and zanabrutinib. Um, and then there are another class of drug called PR3-kinase inhibitor, second line called idololosib, which is effective in modern strums, but not very much used because the BDK inhibitors in the first class are much more, uh, are more effective and less toxic. The last drug we want to talk about is venenoclax, also known as ABT199. And this is a drug that is uh, very effective in COL. It's a drug that is uh, basically uh, developed in Australia 
um, and is very effective in other diseases related to Waldenstrom's. And the indication in Waldenstrom's in the clinical trials uh, are that this drug is also going to be very effective but obviously, because it has not been tested in large numbers of patients, this is not something that you can get funded through the government at this point in time. Next slide, please. Lastly, there are some new drugs that are out there for other types of blood cancers, uh, and these are things which activate the immune system. Uh, these are drugs called nivolumab and pembrolizumab, but unfortunately, they do not, they do not work well for Waldenstrom's. Next slide, next slide, please. Next slide. Uh, okay, so I want to just present some data to um, to uh, to uh, to show why ibrutinib uh, is considered such a great drug um, uh, for Waldenstrom's, and this is a phase three study known as Innovate, and you can see there that uh, our colleague uh, Dr. Trotman uh, and myself are both uh, authors on this study because we contributed patients to this study to prove that ibrutinib was a very good therapy for Waldenstrom's. Next slide, please. So for, to enter this study, the, pa the patients have to have Waldenstrom's macrogonemia, and they, they are allowed to have had rituximab in the past. So rituximab is, the, uh, is a comparison arm compared to ibrutinib. Um, and these patients are then uh, randomized in the blue boxes on the right. So half the patients are randomly assigned to ibrutinib, which is a BTK inhibitor, is a tablet, plus rituximab, which is the antibody I talked about before. Um, and the other half are randomized to arm B, which is where they get placebo plus rituximab. So effectively, the patients in arm B only got rituximab, whereas the patients in arm A got the combination of ibrutinib uh, plus rituximab. And the aim is to see if the uh, combination talking about adding ibrutinib to rituximab is better uh, and in maintaining a good response than those given the, um, uh, the, just the rituximab single agent therapy. Now, this is a phase three study because um, in this case, um, both the patient groups actually got active therapy. So there's no patient who got therapy that does not work. Um, in arm B, although the patients only got rituximab as a single agent, as I pointed out before, in the US, this is regarded as a reasonable standard of care because people do respond. Uh, and the point is to say, does the combination of ibrutinib plus rituximab do better in terms of um, you know, disease uh, responses and how long people stay in remission for compared to um, what was considered a reasonable standard, uh, which is rituximab by itself. So in terms of response rate to start with, so this is a, a complex graph, but essentially the, the patients, uh, the color boxes uh, are the number of proportion of patients who responded. Uh, the yellow ones are the ones in what we call minor response, meaning a 25% reduction in the, in, the, in, the, in the RGM protein. The blue box are the patients in, uh, in, in partial remission, meaning more than a 50% reduction in RGM protein and the orange and green boxes are those with 90% uh, or greater reduction in the paraprotein. On the left bar, you can see that those are patients who are took the ibrutinib plus rituximab arm, and you can see that the overall response is 92%, meaning that of every 100 patients we treated with this combination, 92% had a good remission. Um, on the right side, the response rate uh, in total for patients on the placebo plus rituximab arm, so i.e. those who got rituximab by itself, was 47%, meaning that approximately half the patients responded. So immediately you can see that ibrutinib is a better treatment as the patients had a higher response rate of 92% compared to that of rituximab, which is 47%. What's also important is to note that, in fact, the proportion of patients who are in the better response categories, i.e. the orange and the green bars, are higher for the, the group who took ibrutinib plus rituximab, as opposed to rituximab single agent. So what this tells us immediately is that the, the new arm of therapy containing ibrutinib plus rituximab generates more people who responded well, um, and those who responded had a better response with a greater reduction in the IgM levels. 
Now this slide is somewhat complex, but essentially the three sets of bars are the same treatment arms broken out into these in different disease categories depending on what your gene the genetic subtype of Waldenstroms are. As Dr. Trotman mentioned before, so there are um, that they're different. Uh, the Waldenstroms are usually are mutated for a gene called MRD88, um, and some of them are also mutated for a gene called CXCR4, which can confer resistance to treatment. Uh, so the thing to concentrate on this slide is not to get carried away at the fine detail, but to take a step back and see that across every genetic subgroup of Waldenstroms, that the arm that had ibrutinib in it, which is the, the, the left hand side, the left side of bars, they all have a better response rate compared to those who just got rituximab monotherapy by rituximab therapy by itself, which are the right side of bars. Next slide, please. Now this is what we call a progression-free survival curve. And what this means is that it shows the proportion of patients who remains in remission given a period of time. And on the bottom of the curve graph, you can see that those are the time in months. So these are patients who have been followed up for up to three years or 36 months. And the green curve are the patients uh, who remain in remission on the ibrutinib plus rituximab arm. Um, and the blue curve are the patients who remain in remission over time on the rituximab, uh, rituximab single therapy arm. And you can see that if you got the combination of ibrutinib plus rituximab or on the green curve, you're much more likely to stay in remission at one year, two year, and three year compared to those who took the rituximab single agent treatment. So this is probably for a patient the most meaningful outcome because what you want to know is how long your disease will stay under control for before you need to start another therapy and as you can see, if you just took rituximab by itself as a single agent, then basically the treatment runs out of steam at about the 18 month mark. And most and about half the patients will need to be further treated at 18 months. Whereas for the green curve, like brutinib arm, you can see that beyond three years, uh, there are only very few patients who require, who have relapsed and require further treatment. Next slide, please. So ibrutinib was really a, a wonderful drug, uh, but there were a few problems with ibrutinib. Uh, firstly, it wasn't very clean, so it was a little bit dirty, which meant that it potentially can have more side effect than is desired. And secondly, it doesn't get absorbed all that well. So a company called Beijing came to um, Australia with a drug called Zanabrutinib. Back then it was called BGB3111. Um, and this is a drug that has been redesigned. It's like ibrutinib, but it was more clean, plus the, the, um, the absorption was very good. So the drug levels are very high. And Judith and myself and other friends around Australia, we're very lucky to be given this opportunity to really test this new drug and find out how this compares to ibrutinib and whether this is a better drug compared to ibrutinib. Next slide, please. And this report is one that um, is, uh, has been uh, reported by Judith. And what, what this um, report shows is that uh, basically the patients, uh, almost all the patients who are treated with this new drug for Waldenstrom's responded as the response rates are close to 100%. And then, but more importantly, you look at the proportion of patients in the orange boxes um, at, after 12 weeks of therapy, after 24 weeks of therapy or after one year of therapy, you see that those proportion of patients who are in that very deep response category that we call very good partial remission with a greater than 90% reduction in the RGM level is increasing over time such that if you take the drug for more than one year, uh, about one in three patients will have a very dramatic reduction in RGM levels. And the rest of the patients, even though they haven't quite reached that 90% mark, still have very deep responses in RGM levels, uh, more than 50% in most cases. Next slide, please. This illustrates really in a better way uh, what happens to your RGM level and the blue bar, the, the red curve, the blue error bar, is the RGM level over time. And you can see the RGM level plummets very quickly after starting this new drug, as on the um, and stays low. And then the green curve, the green and brown curve, 
is in fact the hemoglobin, which is the normal rest cells in the blood, which is low when the Waldenstrom's is active. Um, and you can see that after starting the drug, the green curve rises very quickly. And this is because the blood cancer has come under control and the patient's bone marrow function improved over time. Next slide, please. So based on these results, we looked at these new drugs on the Brutinib and thought they looked very promising uh, because the, uh, the side effect seems very benign and the responses seems very good. So we went ahead and conducted what we call a phase three study, which compares directly Ibrutinib, which is the, already is a very good drug, against this new drug on Zanabrutinib. Next slide, please. So this is a study which, and I did not put it to study designing, but essentially half the patients with Waldenstrom's were randomly assigned to get Ibrutinib, and the other half are randomly assigned to get Zanabrutinib. And zanabrutinib is a much cleaner version of ibrutinib with a reduced, with the potential for reduced side effects. And indeed, that's what we saw in this study. So although ibrutinib is a very good drug for Waldenstrom's, it does have a few side effects, including uh, the atrial fibrillation, which is a, a, a very common uh, arrhythmia of the heart, um, diarrhea, as well as bleeding. And you can see in the highlighted blue box, blue letters here, that the new drug, zanabrutinib, did a lot better in terms uh, with a much lower rate of side effects compared to ibrutinib. If you consider all side effects in total, which is the left set of columns, or the, the severe side effects, which are the right set of columns. So for example, this atrial fibrillation problem, which occurs in 15% of patients on ibrutinib, is reduced to 2% on those on zanabrutinib, suggesting that zanabrutinib has a much better um, a safety profile on the heart. And once again, uh, you can see at down the column that in general, zanabrutinib is a much better tolerated drug with the major side effect being low white cell count, um, uh, uh, which is more common than albrutinib. But this is a problem that is a laboratory phenomenon. So the doctors will see that your white cell counts are lower, but does not lead to an increased risk of infection or anything serious. So, there's another drug that I mentioned called venetoclax, and this is different from ibrutinib and zanabrutinib. This is a drug that inhibits an enzyme called BCL2, uh, and this is a drug that is uh, mainly developed in Australia uh, and the US, um, and uh, it's a drug that is already successful in a related disease called CLL, um, but uh, the, our friends in Dalafaba did a study in Waldenstrom's macrogominemia using this single drug. Next slide, please. Next slide. So our friends in Dallas treated 30 patients with Waldenstrom's macrogominemia, and they were treated with this drug called venenoclax, and about half the patients on this study had previously had uh, ibrutinib or a similar drug, and presumably came off that drug because of side effects or because the drug stopped working. Next slide, please. Um, so we don't have the results on there, but it suffice to say that from what we can see from venenoclax, there are in fact quite good responses in a quite a large number of patients. So once again, this is another drug that is very active in Waldenstrom's. And at the moment, we are trying to develop combinations of both ibrutinib plus venenoclax or zanabrutinib plus venenoclax because these are drugs that work independently well in Waldenstrom's and we're trying to combine the drugs to see if you get even better results. And that looks like my last slide. Um, I have ran through, I guess, a number of new drugs which are exciting in Waldenstrom's. Most of these drugs at the moment have not made it to the stage where the government is funding it um, for use. Um, in Australia, the fund that uses still chemotherapy. However, we're hopeful that with uh, uh, your help and uh, our advocacy that we might be able to get uh, some of these treatment options are funded for patients on, in, in Australia. Um, if, luckily for us, we also have a number of clinical trials in Australia where we can access new drugs. Um, and uh, if many of our patients in Australia, and which may include many of you, uh, may be on one of these drugs because you put up your hand to join a clinical trial three, two, three, four years ago, um, 
and uh, manage to get these drugs at an early stage. And for you, all of you who've done that, we thank you. Judith and I thank you. You have um, shown us that these drugs work. Uh, you have uh, improved the quality of medicine and made a difference to all the generation of patients who come after you. Um, and I guess as a side benefit, you also get access to these drugs many years earlier than someone would ordinarily outside of a clinical trial. And with that, I'd like to take some, I'm happy to take questions. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Professor Tam. It's, it's, it is fantastic to see the variety of treatments options that are now available, um, but also the promising developments in new line options that are coming up coming on board. Um, obviously, there's still a long way to go, uh, but it's great to, he to hear of the clinical trials that are currently running here in Australia as well. Um, I know we've certainly had some questions coming through, so I'll swatch, uh, switch back to SNES to run through those. Thank you, Nicole. Yes, and thank you, Professor Tam, for this important uh, update. So first question is, my wife was diagnosed with Waldenstrom macroglobal anemia in April 2017 and has been participating in clinical trial at Peter Mac Cancer Centre in Melbourne since about May 2017. Since then, she visited Peter Mac Hospital every 28 days under the care of hematology team B at Peter Mac. Can you please advise uh, Peter Max plan for Waldenstrom patients who are taking Zanabrutinib daily, twice a day, since May 2017. Okay, so um, so, so once again, thank you. Your wife is obviously one of those patients who allowed us to um, show that the Zanabrutinib uh, is an effective drug in Waldenstrom's. And, you know, once again, this is going to be a lasting gift for generations of treatment of patients to come uh, after yourself and your wife. Um, so at the moment, the plan for Zanabrutinib, because it has worked very well, and I presume that your wife is still continuing to respond, uh, is to continue it indefinitely. This is a drug that we know works, but we also know that it basically pushes the, puts the Waldenstrom's into it like a deep freezer. It doesn't kill it, so that when you take the drug off, the disease tends to come back. And for me, this is a fairly new way to treat cancer because in the past we have given chemotherapy, which is like dropping a bomb on cancer and then letting the cancer grow back. Whereas these days we tend to treat Waldenstrom's with some improvement, a bit like the way we treat blood pressure. You know, you have got blood pressure, you take a blood pressure pill, you've got Waldenstrom's, you take your Waldenstrom's pill on a daily basis. And as long as you take it, the cancer stays away. So um, I, I, I think that for um, the, the, probably the, the question on everyone's mind is, um, uh, you know, now that you've participated in a clinical trial and you've got a really good drug and it's working for you, uh, what's going to happen when the trial finishes? Do you lose access to the drug? And I can reassure you that you will not. Um, so patients who participate in our clinical trials who, uh, who have a good response to drug when the drug is working well with very few side effects, the principle is we'll fight tooth and nail to make sure that you get access um, to the drug for as long as it's benefiting your wife and as long as it's working. Um, so unfortunately for, like I said, fortunate or unfortunately, but most of these new drugs, they work well, but they need, to, they need to be continued. Otherwise, the cancer will come back. We are working on ways to try and combine these drugs so that we can hopefully get the cancer in such a deep remission that we can stop it. But at the moment, those are still uh, ways that we're working on at the moment. And I guess we've at least got past step one, which is looking like you have uh, achieved a response that you have, um, a, you know, control your cancer um, and that, you know, you just need to take your pill on a daily basis. And yes, you do have to come back and visit us, unfortunately, because on the clinical trial, um, you know, we need to record everything very carefully uh, and look for side effects very carefully. So, you know, apologies ahead of time for the travel. Thank you. So next question is, uh, what is the role of bone marrow transplant, both uh, allogeneic and autologous in Waldenstrom, given so many highly effective drugs and treatments options at the moment? Um, so bone marrow transplant is a fairly uncommonly used in Waldenstrom these days, mainly because we do have so many good treatment options. Um, so, you know, one back 12 years and 15 years, we, um, you know, we do occasionally do bone marrow transplant, which is used in big doses of chemotherapy to try and treat Waldenstrom's. But to be honest, I haven't really, I don't really remember 
doing bone marrow transplant on a patient, you know, at least in the past five years, just because we've got so many good treatment options. Now, it could well be that, um, you know, the, the cancer is very clever and they do, they can learn to escape from our treatment. So it could well be that, you know, five or 10 years from now, that um, if we do not keep on innovating and developing new treatment for all the instruments, that the cancer will have seen all our tricks and we start to develop resistance to, you know, all our new drugs, in which case we may need to resort back to a bone marrow transplant in, in you know, very few patients. But we're hoping that, you know, with the help of patients and new clinical trials and new treatment coming along that we'll never have to go back to that time, never have to go back to those days. Very good, thank you. And the next question is, is CAR T cell therapy an option for Waldenstrom and amyloidosis patients? Yep, so excellent question. So um, uh, maybe I would, um, maybe I would, I would sign, I would, um, focus on, on, on Waldenstrom's. Amyloidosis is a slightly different issue. So amyloidosis is a disease where Waldenstrom's has ended up with, deposit, with um, de deposition of proteins in different organs in the body, which then stops the heart and liver from working properly. Um, so, uh, but let's concentrate on Waldenstrom's, which is the, the, the more common scenario. And CAR T cell therapy may well work for Waldenstrom's, although it has not really been tested in a large number of patients because Waldenstrom's have got so many good treatment options and CAR therapy tends to be, you know, when you have a new therapy, you test it in patients and diseases where there aren't too many good treatment options and there's not much for patients to lose. Um, and But CAR T cell therapy, which is a type of therapy where we uh, hijack a patient's immune system and we uh, instruct the immune system to attack uh, cancer cells, has worked very well, not only in fast-growing lymphoma, but also in very close relatives of Waldenstrom's, a disease called chronic infected leukemia, and also a disease called mantle cell lymphoma. So there's every prospect that CAR therapy will work in Waldenstrom's, but it is still a fairly new procedure. Um, patients of Waldenstrom's have got many, many good treatment options, and the suggestion is that you should let us practice our CAR therapies on other, th other diseases until we get really good at it, and then at which time we may then move it on the Waldenstrom's. Thank you, Professor Tem. I, I know you alluded to in this presentation to this, but there is a question. I've been on Innovate C arm a trial, just Ibrutinib, since 2014. My IgM is now creeping up again. Why does Ibrutinib lose its effect? Yeah, so uh, unfortunately for us, cancer is very clever. So cancer is constantly trying to break through of our treatment. And we know that, um, uh, you know, for many patients with Waldenstrom's where eventually the, the, the disease develops resistance to ibrutinib, what happens is that the disease actually changes the protein where ibrutinib binds so that the drug can no longer bind um, the, 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 the cancer cell and do its action. Um, so there are other treatment options for patients who have relapsed beyond ibrutinib, and this will be venetoclax or things which are similar to venetoclax. Um, but it is unfortunate, you know, cancer is quite clever and, you know, we need to stay one step ahead of cancer and develop new drugs as resistance comes along. Right, thank you. Um, for those of us currently on watch and wait regimen, does the three monthly blood test provide an early warning view onto any other potential non-Waldenstrom cancer related activity in the body? Uh -huh. So uh, I guess the question is, do your free monthly blood test, um, is it a good test for other types of cancer? So to preface this, patients with Waldenstrom are at a higher risk of other types of cancer. We don't understand why, but certainly, you know, in cancer medicine in general, if someone's had one type of cancer, they're more likely to get a different type of cancer. Um, and it might just be, you know, uh, you know, the way that people are born or the way that, or the exposures that, you know, that led to the cancer to develop in the first place. So we do advocate for screening for, um, for, um, for other types of cancers, but and a blood test is a little bit useful because the blood test is mainly to use to monitor for, for Waldenstrom's uh, and it may incidentally pick up signs of other cancer. But what's important to realize is that the blood test is not really 
a great way to pick up other types of cancer. So you still need to do all the good healthy things like stop smoking, um, get you know, uh, get, uh, get your colonoscopy and your and your things done and your and your mammograms done and your pap smears done, because other cancers do happen and the blood test does not detect uh, reliably the early onset of other cancers. Very good. And just last question, straightforward, uh, Professor Tem, is wellness through macroglobulinemia curable at this stage? Mm -hmm. So cure implies that the disease is gone forever and ever and we never come back and no, we, we, we don't have the technology to cure uh, the, the disease and get rid of every last cancer cell in the body. However, most of my patients and most of Judith's patients with Walden's drums who respond well to drugs go back to live a normal lifespan. And the moment we don't know how long this normal lifespan is because we've gone from having very few treatment options to having lots of treatment options. So patients um, who fail where one treatment option becomes resistant can go on to the next one. And, you know, it's always impossible to say at the start when someone's diagnosed and or even when they have received the first therapy, how long they will live for, except to say that they won't live for a very long time. You know, we're talking about many, many years, um, probably over 10 years or longer uh, from the start of therapy. Um, and, um, and you know, if you manage to live till you are 80 or 85 and you um, have a good life and you have a good quality of life and you start to you know, suffer from other medical illnesses, which may ultimately end up being fatal, um, well, that's in a way, it's not cure, but it's achieved our goal of keeping, stopping cancer from shortening your life and stopping cancer from affecting your life. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, over to you, Nicole. Thanks, Nez. Um, yeah, just with uh, being conscious of time, we'd like to introduce our last speaker for this afternoon, David Young, who's the current team leader from WM Aussies. Um, he's a key collaborator in today's event and passionate advocate for WM patients. Uh, David, of course, has his own experiences with Wardenstroms and has bravely put his hand up to share some of his own insights and learnings since diagnosis and to discuss how this led to his own involvement with WM Aussies. Now, David was a little unsure of his internet stability at home, um, so has pre-recorded his talk for us, which we'll load now, um, but he is going to attempt to jump back in afterwards live, um, should you have any questions for him. Hi, my name's David Young, and I'm the head of WM Aussies and a WM patient. I'm 63 years old and had WM for nine years, and I live in Byron Bay. Over that time, I've become a cancer advocate, setting up and running cancer support groups locally and liaising with various cancer organisations nationally. In 2012, I was diagnosed with WM after my doctor noticed some anomalies in my blood results. At the time, I was 52, married and working. When I was first diagnosed, I was distraught, as was my wife. The assumption of getting older together shattered and the grief very real. After the initial shock, I recovered fairly quickly and managed a glass half full approach and remained positive. However, after a few months, I suffered a massive meltdown of anger and tears and immediately went into depression for a few weeks. I'd been here before and I knew the drill. Be kind to yourself, be patient, it will pass. It did. And since then, I have felt normal and my usual positive self. The first haematologist I saw gave me two to six years to live and said I should start RCHOP chemo for the following week. I went straight home and started to research online everything I could about WM. It soon became obvious that the haematologist was out of date and I quickly got a second opinion. The second haematologist put me on watch and wait and I started treatment with rituximab by itself in 2015, which kept me going for a couple of years with no side effects. Before I had started the rituximab, my symptoms were fatigue, night sweats and cramps. In the meantime, I had joined WM Elsies and the IWMF support chat groups, which were a great source of information and support. I was slowly becoming educated in WM and how to navigate the medical system and the roller coaster of emotions. Around this time, I started a general cancer support group in Byron Bay, as there were no local support groups in our area at that time. This has since grown to three groups supported by the Cancer Council. One day I got an email from WM Aussie's chat group saying there was a new clinical trial for WM. It was comparing two targeted therapies with each other, ibrutinib and xanabrutinib. 
I went straight to the website and found the haematologist in charge of the Brisbane arm of the, tri uh, of the trial, and I rang her. Thanks to WM Aussies, I was quick off the mark and got onto the trial straight away. I started taking the oral drug Xanabrutinib in 2017, and it started working within a month. And after a short period, all my symptoms had started to disappear. And four years later, I'm still on the extended trial and all my blood levels are almost normal. I feel very lucky. Being the new head of WM Aussies has made me realise just what an amazing job we do in supporting people in Australia with WM. We are lucky also to be supported by various cancer organisations such as the Leukaemia Foundation and the IWMF and many others. The aim of WM Aussies is to support WM patients in Australia, raise awareness of WM and where possible to raise money for WM research. We're also involved in getting the latest drugs on the government's pharmaceutical benefit scheme, helping to create educational forums such as this one and other live educational events, running online patient support groups and chat rooms and generally advocating for WM patients. The team that runs it all are all volunteers. WM Aussies was founded in 2003 by Gareth Evans, a WM patient and advocate with the help of the IWMF. I was lucky enough to meet Gareth after my diagnosis as we both live near Byron Bay. He was a great help to me and I think would be quite amused that I now head the organisation. After Gareth's death in 2013, the organisation continued to grow and a dedicated team of, team of people ran it. Colin Perot took over from Gareth in 2011 until about 2013 and achieved a great deal, including creating the WM Aussies website, now managed by Peter Carr, another WM Aussies star volunteer. Andrew Warden took over after Colin and became the head of the organisation and up until recently was very much a one man band supported by the team. Andrew's contribution has been phenomenal and we will miss him greatly in the role. He still works in some projects behind the scenes. I encourage anyone who has not yet joined WM Aussies to do so, and in so doing, help the organisation to help you. The more people that join, the more we will get done to improve outcomes for WM patients, and the sooner we will come up with a cure for it. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks so much, David. Um, we appreciate it's not always easy to share your own personal journey. Uh, so we thank you for your honesty and your insights there. Um, although no two people's experiences are ever the same, I think it can be really valuable for people to hear not only from the experts, but also from others who've been diagnosed with the same condition and have a true lived experience with the disease as well. Um, it, I know uh, you've had a little few issues with the computer this afternoon, but we might try and see if we can cross to you for a few questions if we can. Uh, thanks, Ness. I don't see any questions for 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 uh, David. Just let me double check. However, I do have a question myself, if you don't mind, David. Sure. So my questions would be: What final piece of advice or what tips can you give to people in the audience who maybe have just been diagnosed, or recently diagnosed, and are watching ways like you were for years um, to help themselves to cope better? with the journey that is ahead of them. I know you touched base um, in one of our newsletters. That sure. was a great article. And uh, uh -huh. yeah, if you could give some tips and share some tips. Um, look, I think uh, for people who have been newly diagnosed, um, the best advice I can give is to um, stay up to date on the latest information. Um, if you're um, comfortable being uh, on a computer and, and doing research, uh, simply um, you know keep keep up to date. And um, the chat forums are for WM Aussies um, on the Leukemia Foundation uh, Facebook chat group is a great way of staying informed. Um, and there are many other other useful you know a lot of useful information online. Um, uh, and obviously, you know, common sense things about just simply looking after yourself um, and getting help where you need it, whether that's emotional support, um, making sure that you ask uh, your haematologist uh, any question uh, that you want, maybe taking a, 
um, an advocate with you, someone um, that you trust uh, to, you know, two lots of um, heads and ears are better than one, uh, as we often forget what, um, you know, what the haematologist has told us uh, in a session. Um, those, yeah, that sort of stuff is, um, you know, common sense stuff is great. Um, but mainly stay, you know, stay, stay positive because things are pretty good these days. Um, the, as, as Con was saying, you know, the, there's new drugs coming up all the time and we have now the chance to live with the disease rather than dying from it. And uh, that's just getting more and more likely as time goes on. Can I say, Snez, I um, think, David, your advice about taking someone with you to the appointment is, is really, really valuable advice. Um, and also uh, take it, writing down your questions as they occur so that you remember them when you come to the appointment is another good tip. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Judith. Yeah, no, absolutely. Fantastic advice all around there, I think. Uh, well, just a little conscious of time, guys, so we might we might start wrapping up. But I, in closing today, I guess I just want to thank everyone for joining us, wherever you are based, around Australia or New Zealand. Uh, we sincerely hope that you found the sessions informative and the interactive Q&A options of benefit as well. Um, in the coming days, a recording of today's event will be uploaded to YouTube and posted on the Leukemia Foundation and I believe WM Aussie's websites for anyone who is not able to attend or would like to re-watch any of the sessions as well. Uh, we'll be sending out some feedback forms, so we'd certainly appreciate it if you do have the time to provide your thoughts and suggestions so that we can endeavour to continue producing programs that you find relevant and beneficial into the future. Um, if you have any questions or are requiring more personal support, I would encourage you to reach out uh, by calling our 1800 line. You can be put in touch with your closest blood cancer support coordinator. Uh, we've put up on the screen both the Leukemia Foundation and Foundation. WM Aussie's website addresses, along with the link to the WM Facebook page, uh, which is a great opportunity to connect with others with WM all around the country. A uh, huge thank you once again to all of our guest speakers today and WM Aussies as our co-contributors in today's event and we wish you a really good afternoon. Thank you.